The new MacBook Pro is the most powerful laptop Apple has ever created. However, they offer five different SoCs with different combinations of CPU and GPU cores. After spending several months with them, which version is right for you? Let's get into it. I have spent the last three months with three different MacBook Pro laptops, which represent what I would term the low, medium, and high versions, both in performance and price. At the low end, I have the base model with the M1 Pro with 8 CPU cores and 14 GPU cores, 16GB of RAM, and 512GB SSD at $19.99. For the medium level, I have the M1 Pro with 10 CPU and 16 GPU cores, 16GB of RAM, and 1TB SSD at $24.99. I know, some people will want to comment that having 32GB for $28.99 would have been the medium level, and I agree. Sometimes you just have to take what is in stock. For the high end, I have the M1 Max with 10 CPU and 32 GPU cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and a two terabyte SSD at $4,099. Now, I like to compare Apple Silicon performance, both CPU and GPU, to what is offered in the PC world by AMD, Intel, and Nvidia for two reasons. One, it allows me to quickly gauge what level of performance Apple is offering. And two, it allows me to quickly understand what am I getting for the money that I'm spending? Am I paying more for the pretty package versus the performance level? Or are they delivering more performance and offering better value than PCs? Apple Silicon is different, but you can objectively quantify its performance levels to compare. Starting with the CPU, they are offering you either 8 cores or 10 cores. For multi-core performance, the 8-core part is like the previous gen 6-core CPUs from Intel's Skylake generation, or AMD's Zen 2 CPUs in their Ryzen 3000 and 4000 series. And Apple's 10-core part is like an 8-core CPU from Intel's 9th and 10th gen, or AMD's Zen 2 CPUs. I did cover CPU benchmarking using Geekbench and Cinebench in great detail in Part 2. However, I also did benchmarking in several apps like Blender. And even though Blender is M1 aware, it is still running using Rosetta 2. Just like I showed in my M1 iMac comparison video, the performance does suffer some 20 to 30% and is something you need to consider if you are using apps not yet optimized for Apple Silicon. I will show the numbers on screen for reference and you can pause the video for more details. All three apps are CPU intensive and heavy rendering programs and performance scaling between the new 8 and 10 core M1 Pro is as expected and there is no difference between the 10 core M1 Pro and 10 core M1 Max SoCs. From the data, it is clear that Apple is falling behind in performance to both AMD and Intel. AMD launched Zen 3 or their Ryzen 5000 CPUs at the same time Apple launched the first M1 in November of 2020. Their 6-core CPU in the Ryzen 5600X is only 10% slower than Apple's best 10-core CPU in the M1 Max. And AMD's 8-core CPU in the 5800X is 23% faster than the 10-core M1 Max. And Intel's recently launched 12th gen CPUs are much faster and are now the fastest CPUs on the market. I understand they are more power hungry, but they are faster. Apple needs to move beyond the M1 cores and pick up the pace of development. For the GPU, I have covered that topic in detail in three previous videos. In part three, I compared the M1 Max to the RTX 3080, as well as to other GPUs in various benchmarks and games, in part 4, I showed how the 14-inch MacBook Pro is power limited and not thermally limited, and that keeps the M1 Max performance 10-20% to lower than if it was in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. And in part 5, I compared all the M1 GPUs from 8 to 32 cores to each other and to discrete GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA, and also showed the media encoder performance between them. I will just refer you to those videos if you want to learn more details about the M1 GPUs and their performance. I spent quite a bit of time looking at fan speed and which speed started to become noticeable. I can simply say that if you use the M1 Pro with 10 cores or the M1 Max to render, you will hear the fan. It's not obnoxious like the Intel-based MacBooks, but it's there. The base model under load does not spin up the fan as high and is much quieter. If having a quiet environment is important to you and fan noise is a concern and you need the higher core count models, then I would just get those in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Let's look at the SSD speeds between the 512GB, 1TB, and 2TB SSDs in the MacBook Pro, and I'll throw in the 256GB in my M1 Mac Mini as a comparison. Starting with Blackmagic Design Disk Speed Test, the 2TB in the M1 Max has the highest speeds, however, the 1TB in the M1 Pro is very, very close. 
The 512GB SSD has similar read speeds, it just has slightly lower write speeds. I did not notice the speed difference between the 512GB and the 1TB. However, I did notice the speed difference of any new 14-inch MacBook Pro against a 256GB SSD in my M1 Mac Mini. It wasn't horrible, just noticeable when you use the system side by side. I also have the Blackmagic RAW speed test and the overall performance differences are similar to the disk speed test. The 1TB is similar to the 2TB, the 512GB is slightly slower, and the 256GB in the M1 is the slowest. Finally, I also included the benchmark testing using Amorphous Disk Mark, since that also shows the random read-write speeds in addition to the sequential read-write speeds. You can pause to look at the numbers, but overall my conclusion does not change. The 1TB gives you performance similar to the 2TB, but if you can live with the 512GB, that is the best value. As AMD, Intel, and Nvidia launch their next-gen chips and laptops, the M1 Pro and M1 Max will not have the most powerful CPU or the most powerful GPU. Apple Silicon will not top the benchmarks. However, after using these laptops for the last three months, that just doesn't matter as much anymore. What Apple has done with Apple Silicon is change the way I view laptops and what I want in a laptop. What do I mean? Traditionally, a laptop CPU and GPU is nothing more than a desktop part that has been detuned and clocked to run at a lower frequency, to consume less power, and to generate less heat. Manufacturers then try to cram as much CPU and GPU horsepower into a laptop that is thermally possible. Apple has turned that traditional concept on its head. They have come from a completely opposite direction. They took a CPU and GPU for a phone and then scale it up to a laptop. The benefit of doing that is that in the implementation for a phone, a mobile phone, battery life and efficiency is always a top priority. As a result, Apple has the most efficient laptop in the market. For a laptop, being mobile and having long battery life is a key distinguishing feature that separates Apple Silicon from anything in the PC world. And the performance is good enough. Really, battery life for this level of performance is unparalleled. And that's what Apple has done. Apple Silicon in the laptop has changed my expectations for what I now want in a laptop. In using the M1 MacBook Air for the past year and now the new MacBook Pros, I have an expectation that the battery alone will get me through the day. I don't need to worry about plugging in my MacBook Pro somewhere around lunchtime or early afternoon. I no longer suffer from low battery anxiety. Apple has reset expectations for laptop performance and battery life, and Apple is far ahead, and it will take those other companies years to catch up. In the MacBook Pro, Apple targeted a very specific group. At the October 18th event, they told us that most of the pros who buy a Mac buy a MacBook Pro, and those pros use it to create apps, to create music, and to create video. They never said it went after gamers. And from that perspective, they delivered an incredibly new, powerfully efficient, and mobile tool for those creators. And even though it won't top the CPU or GPU benchmark charts, they will be close enough. They won't have the most horsepower under the hood. They didn't try to build a dragster. Instead, they have done something different. It's like they optimized every part of the system to provide a highly refined experience that can handle all the twists and turns and provide a much more balanced machine. For me, it's the integration of the media engine and the long battery life that makes it special and delivers an overall fantastic user experience. But if you're not the target user, then you would be better served looking at some of the new laptops. I would not recommend this as a gaming machine. It can game, but it's not the right tool for the job. For example, you can use a set of butter knives to put together your PC, but you're better off with a proper toolkit. Get the right tool for the right job. Before getting these three laptops, I thought I knew which laptop I would like most and which I would like least, in this order. But after using them for three months, that has completely changed. When I first saw the lineup, I thought the 10 CPU cores and the 16 GPU cores would be the perfect balance and the one to get. However, after three months of use, there were very few cases where I could tell the difference in the performance between the base model M1 Pro and the slightly upgraded M1 Pro. One noticeable difference between the base and the upgraded M1 Pro was that the upgraded model always seemed to be warmer to the touch and the battery life was never as good as the base model. That's really where the base model stood out. Cooler running and longer battery life. Sure, performance wise, it was the weakest of the three, but it delivered enough performance for most tasks day in and day out. Now the battery life isn't as good as my M1 MacBook Air, but it got me through the day just fine. And you get all the same goodness, the same keyboard, same trackpad, same screen, same 1080p webcam, same sound. 
you get all that same goodness in the base model as you do in the most expensive MacBook Pro. Another thing to think about, to upgrade to the M1 Pro with 10 CPU and 16 GPU cores, you pay an additional $300. If you study Apple's pricing, you can deduce that Apple charges $100 for each CPU performance core and $50 for each GPU core. You can look at the charts to see how close they are in performance, but for me, it's not worth $300. I would only recommend the 10 core M1 Pro to people who day in and day out benefit by having the extra CPU cores. For example, people who do audio work in Logic Pro and are in a complex or high number of tracks or developers that compile large amounts of code on a regular basis. And if you're a high-end user that works on 8K video, lots of effects, multiple streams of 4K, and you will need more than 16 gigabytes of RAM, then go straight to the M1 Max with 32 GPU cores. The 32-core GPU is $200 more expensive than the 24-core version, so that works out to just $25 per core, and that is a deal compared to the M1 and M1 Pro where they charge $50 a core. Plus, the 32-core M1 Max will have better resale value in the future. Just don't get it in the 14-inch package. Get it in the 16-inch MacBook Pro so you get the bigger battery and better power delivery for the full performance. As I showed in part three, the M1 Max with 32 core GPU is competitive in high-end laptop offerings from AMD and Nvidia and is among the best for anything mobile. It will provide workstation-like performance in native applications. It will allow you to be mobile and have the freedom to move around without being tied to an electrical outlet. Overall, the new MacBook Pro is the best laptop Apple has ever produced for its professional creatives. It's a laptop that just does what you need, all very efficiently, and allows you to just create. And if you're not a professional creative or maybe just starting out with a limited budget, then I would highly recommend the M1 Mac Mini or the M1 MacBook Air. I have both of these machines and they would be an excellent choice for entry-level creators. With the M1, you get a lot of value for your dollar. If you missed one of my previous videos in the series with deep dives into the CPU and GPU performance, click on one of these. Thank you all so very much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you in the next one.